first you have some time to look at questions one to six. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Yes, so that's Janet Thompson. Would you like me to spell it? If you wouldn't mind, thank you. Just the surname, please. No problem. It's T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. Great. Now, Janet, before we go through the openings I have here in front of me, might I just take a few more details to complete your profile on my system? Of course. What would you like to know? Well, let's start with your email address, please. OK. Thompson at hort.net. I see. Is that Jan as in J-A-N? No, that wasn't available. I had to make do with J-A-N-N. Here, let me spell it for you again, just to be sure. J-A-N-N-T-H-O-M-P son at hort.net much obliged and could i ask do you have your referee details to hand yes what do you need i need one work reference and one character reference from a friend or colleague okay for a work reference there's jane foot she's my former boss at bermuda girls school head of english okay my personal referee is monica carbody Mon and I have been best friends since we met in Bermuda in 1991, when she was deputy head of English under Mrs Foote. Perfect. And you mentioned, of course, that you're an English teacher, but are there any additional subjects you're qualified to teach? Yes, I have a diploma in special needs, and I can also do history to GCSE level. Very good. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Do you think I stand a good chance of finding something? Oh, better than good. In fact, we have some positions we can offer you today. You see, it's not so difficult to find a temporary role. Tell you the truth, there are plenty of them around, but getting a permanent position will prove a little more trying, though. Would you be prepared to take up a position short term? Of course, anything that pays. Excellent. Well, there are three positions that I can offer you right now. The first is a teacher of English in LaSalle School. I'm sure you know it, right in the city centre. Yes, near where I live, actually. Even better. Well, it's a six-month contract, and the very attractive thing about this role is that the head of English at LaSalle will, if she's satisfied with your performance after six months, offer to make you a permanent member of staff. Wow, that's food for thought. It certainly is, bearing in mind what I said before about how hard it is to find a permanent role. The second position I have to offer you is in a school near Chelsea. It's called the Chelsea Free School. Are you familiar? I can't say that I've heard of it. Well, this contract is for one year, which is a lot better, looking at it from a short-term job security perspective, than the first role I mentioned. But you also have to realise that you are a temporary replacement for a female teacher who has taken maternity leave. There is no prospect of the position being made permanent. I see. I have one other vacancy at the minute, though I doubt you'll find it quite so appealing. It's situated in rural Cambridgeshire. I'll spell that just in case you want to take it down. C-A-M-B-R-I-D-G-E-S-H-I-R-E. -E. And the school simply goes by the name Cambridge, though it's not in any way related to the other more well-known establishment of the same name. I was just going to ask that. What a lovely location, though, eh? Yes, but there's a catch. It's only a six-week contract to cover for someone on extended sick leave. I see. Well, I guess that's ruled out then. What sort of, sort of salary can I...? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an accommodation officer telling students about different halls of residence. You now have thirty seconds to read questions eleven to fifteen. Good afternoon, and welcome to Stanton University. I'm here to tell you about the various halls of residence we have available, should you choose to come here. We aim to offer accommodation in halls to all first-year students, and you'll find there's a good variety to choose from. First of all, there's Brown Hall, which, as you'll see, is not the most modern of buildings, but it is very popular with some students. It's got a good sense of community, some nice refurbished kitchens, and unlike the other halls, it has recently had a gym built in its basement. Another option is Blake Residence, which is built like a large house, and so everybody cooks and eats together. It has its own sectioned-off bit of private garden, and is even more peaceful because this is an all-girls residence. Although, of course, boys are allowed to visit the hall, and uh, I understand frequently take part in cooking dinner. The largest hall we have is Queen's Building, and this has been upgraded recently. The original parking area has been built on, so that the hall now has a large common room, and each bedroom now has its own shower room, which many students regard as a real bonus. A further option is the Parkway Flats, which won an award for design in its day. And this building now has a preservation order on it. This has meant that only a limited amount could be done to upgrade it, and the surrounding area is important, so parking is not permitted around the flats. However, the flats do have many extra facilities, such as a special computer room, a small library, and a self-service restaurant. The cost of breakfast, lunch, and dinner is covered in the fees for this hall, so it does look a bit more expensive. The last residence we can offer you is Temple Rise, which again is slightly more expensive than other halls, as the rooms are larger. This has got very lovely views across to the coast, and. This more than compensates for the fact that bathrooms here are shared between six students. However, the hall has domestic staff who clean the rooms once a week, so this is perhaps an attractive option for the messier amongst you. You now have thirty seconds to read questions sixteen to twenty. Now, if I can just show on this wall map here where they all are, you might like to go and have a look round. If you come into the main university entrance, at the first junction, you'll find that Brown Hall is on the corner opposite the theatre. So you're nice and near the station here, though I think it can get a bit noisy with traffic. The same applies to Blake Residence, which is directly facing the junction to the university entrance. These halls are often used by medical students and such like, as they're out all day, so don't notice the noise. 
Anyway, if you then walk along Campus Road towards the main circle, you'll see the library on the corner, and Queen's Building is just past that as you head north. You will find that it is quieter here, and you may get fewer visitors. By the way, the circle is quite a feature of the campus, as it's set into the hills and has a brand new sports centre in the middle. It's worth going to look around it. Now, the Parkway Flats are on the opposite corner to the library, facing the circle, as you head towards the main buildings. The main buildings are only about a five-minute walk from here, and places in these halls go quickly, so my advice is to reserve your place as soon as possible. Then, Temple Rise is inside the circle, next to the sports centre, but further from the main university buildings. Now, if you'd like to go off and physically... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two business studies students, Evelyn and Mark, preparing for a seminar presentation. Before you hear the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Well, I think the marketing of food would be a good topic. I read a very interesting article the other day about the Canadian food market. Hmm. I suppose everybody's interested in food, even if it's trying not to eat. Why Canada? I know that's where you come from, but isn't it just all North America, really? No. That's why I thought this article was interesting. Although lots of U.S. companies are well established in Canada, and vice versa, there are still subtle differences between the two markets. It says here, the Canadian market is definitely not a northern clone of the U.S. I like that. And it says that if you understand these differences, it can have a big impact on successful food marketing. So I know that Canada has a big French-speaking population in Quebec, is this what they're referring to? Not only French and English speakers, there are many different ethnic groups in Canada. It's really quite multicultural. For example, Toronto has large Asian and Italian populations, and Vancouver's got a large Asian population too. And, because Canada's population is small, these groups make quite an impact, introducing new styles of cooking. So, you can see lots of unfamiliar vegetables and things in the markets, and new restaurants are opening every day. It's great if you love trying out new foods, as many people do. Which kinds of food are becoming popular? Well, some Asian food, I'd say, has been popular for quite a while, like Chinese. But now, Southeast Asian restaurants are becoming very fashionable. Then, there's Mediterranean, of course such as Greek, Italian, and so on. But Caribbean and Mexican food is really taking off among young people these days. So are the supermarkets starting to stock the ingredients that are needed to prepare these foods at home? You know, all those unusual condiments and sauces. Yes, that's right. It's quite interesting going to the supermarket, isn't it? And noticing how they're introducing sections for foods of different nationalities. 
You can buy quite exotic products locally these days. The article mentioned that 80% of the Canadian retail market is controlled by eight major national supermarket chains, so that when they introduce changes, they can happen quite rapidly. Okay. Well, how are we going to organize this seminar then? I made some notes on the trends in the Canadian market about changing tastes and also patterns for where food is consumed. I thought maybe we could summarize it into a chart or table and maybe use the overhead projector to present it. Good idea. Maybe I could have a look for similar trends and tastes in Australia and the UK for comparison. Let's have a look at what you found. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now, as the conversation continues, answer questions 26 to 30. The most significant trend, it seemed to me, was that Canadians are definitely interested in healthy food. For example, did you know that salads are the third most commonly eaten food in Canadian restaurants? Really? What about organic food then? Is that becoming more popular? Yes, it's definitely moving into the mainstream compared to a few years ago. And a recent survey showed that four out of five shoppers said that they check the fat and nutritional information on the packet when they're deciding what to buy. What other trends did you find out? There's one change I noticed straight away when I was home last year in the meat department. You know, here the meat packaging says rump steak or four-quarter chops and so on. Well, they discovered that most consumers these days didn't know what to do with these roasts and rounds and ribs. So the government approved a new naming system for cuts of meat, which is related to the required cooking technique. What a good idea. I've never really understood the difference between sirloin, rump, round and all those names. So how many new categories are there? Eight. There are three kinds of steak, for grilling, for marinating and for simmering. And then there's what they call quick serve beef, for stir fries I suppose. And premium oven roast, oven roast, pot roast and stewing beef. It's a great idea, isn't it? I hope it catches on here. I agree. Any other trends that you thought were significant? Well, what's really interesting is what the article called mobile meals. In other words, more and more Canadians are eating meals away from home, but not just eating more junk food. They're projecting a 40% increase in snack food sales over the next three years, and the growth is coming from healthy snacks. You know, the ones that have less cholesterol and fat, such as muesli bars, health food bars, and those types of products. Apparently, in the food marketing jargon, they're called nutritious portable foods, which means healthy snacks. The other major trend is that young people are doing more of the food shopping these days, so marketing has to be aimed more at them, as well as more conventionally at the mother. Thanks, Evelyn. I think we'll have an interesting discussion about these trends and the comparisons with other English-speaking countries. I'll see if I can get some information about them to compare with yours and meet you on Friday to put it together. See you then. Bye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecture on human civilization. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Today, in our history series lectures, Professor Smith is going to introduce the history of human civilization. Welcome, Professor Smith. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Do you know when human civilization originated, and what's the development of human language? Well, the first two stages in the development of civilized man were probably the invention of primitive weapons and the discovery of fire. Though nobody knows exactly when he acquired the use of the latter, the origin of language is also obscure. No doubt, it began very gradually. Animals have a few cries that serve as signals, but even the highest apes have not been found able to pronounce words, even with the most intensive professional instruction. Apparently, a necessity for the mastering of speech is the superior brain of man. When man became sufficiently intelligent, we must suppose that he gradually increased the number of cries for different purposes. It was a great day when he discovered that speech could be used for narrative. There are those who think that in this respect, picture language preceded oral language. A man could draw a picture on the wall of his cave to show in which direction he had gone. Or what prey he hoped to catch. Probably, picture language and oral language developed side by side. I'm inclined to think that language has been the most important single factor in the development of man. Two important stages came not so long before the dawn of written history. The first was the domestication of animals. The second was agriculture. Agriculture was a step in human progress to which, subsequently, there was nothing comparable until our own machine age. Agriculture made possible an immense increase in the number of the human species in the regions where it could be successfully practiced. These were, at first, only those in which nature fertilized the soil after each harvest. Agriculture met with violent resistance from the pastoral nomads, but the agricultural way of life prevailed in the end because of the physical comforts it provided. Another fundamental technical advance was writing, which, like spoken language, Developed out of pictures, but as soon as it had reached a certain stage, it was possible to keep records and transmit information to people who were not present when the information was given. These inventions and discoveries—fire, speech, weapons, domestic animals, agriculture, and writing—made the existence of civilized communities possible. From about 3000 BC until the Industrial Revolution, less than 200 years ago. There was no technical advance comparable to these. During this long period, man had enough time to become accustomed to his technique and to develop the beliefs and political organizations to appropriate it. There was, of course, an immense extension in the area of civilized life. At first, it had been confined to the Nile, the Euphrates, the Tigris, and the Indus. But at the end of the period in question, it covered much the greater part of the livable globe. I do not mean to suggest that there was no technical progress during this long time. There was progress. There were even two inventions of great importance, namely gunpowder and the mariner's compass. But neither of these can be compared in their revolutionary power to such things as speech and writing and agriculture. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.